know then later in your career, right, you, you, you actually worked at Sprott. And I'm curious to know, you know, what was it like to work closely with an investor as well as precious metals fanatic like Eric Sprott? Are there any memorable highlights that you'd want to share? Well, Eric is a spectacular human being. Uh, what many people don't know about him is just how nice he is. And so the first thing that I'd like to say is uh, when uh, Sprott bought my businesses, first my lending business, uh, which became Sprott Resource Lending, and then later my money management and asset management business, uh, after the second takeover, which is to say the takeover of the U.S. operations, um, a bunch of the Canadians came down to California to meet their new staff. and We had them uh, over to dinner at our house. And at one point in time in the evening, uh, I noticed Eric was missing. And I assumed that he had snuck downstairs for a smoke where his wife couldn't catch him. You know, uh, uh, it turned out that Eric had noticed that, you know, my wife was putting on the whole party uh, and he just decided that she shouldn't have to wash the dishes. So the billionaire who had just bought my business was in my house washing the dishes so that my wife wouldn't have to, which told me an awful lot uh, about who he was. A nice guy and, by the way, a tactical genius. My wife was on his side ever since. Uh, and so I would say uh, that that's one of my, my favorite Eric Sprott stories. Uh, what I noticed about Eric that I think is common among, you know, sort of eccentric billionaires is that because their decision making is so rapid and because they're so willing to take risk uh, that you don't, ins that you don't assume that uh, the proper level of empirical process is taking place. What you learn with Eric is that he was brought up in business as a CA, the Canadian equivalent of the US CPA. Uh, and, and he was very, very, very capable of empirical processes. He read and reads uh, annual reports and financial statements, things like that voraciously. He's done so much empirical work that he can synthesize them and do them intuitively. Uh, and I've watched uh, other people. Uh, I'm thinking about the now deceased Adolf Lundin and Robert Friedland, uh, who uh, appear to make impetuous decisions, uh, but in fact uh, have engaged in high level empirical work for so long that they can shortcut some aspects of the process and make what appears to be intuitive decisions that are in fact very, very empirical. The third thing I would say about Eric is he has this wonderful facility with arithmetic uh, that defies psychology, which is to say Eric will happily take two or three or four 50% losses uh, uh, to make a 2,000% gain. Uh, what Eric tells you is that the math around speculation, if you have the psychological stability to do it, is such that 1,000 or 2,000% gain uh, amortizes a hell of a lot of 30 or 40 or 50% mistakes uh, and still leaves room left over at the end of the day. Most investors don't have either the psychological or the financial staying power to do uh, what Eric uh, or Doug Casey or other true speculators do. They talk a rough game. Oh yeah, this isn't my first rodeo. I've experienced losses before. And then uh, in a market decline, when things are getting cheaper and they ought to be speculating, uh, they lose their courage, curl up on the couch in fetal conditions and whimper, you know? <laughs> uh, Eric, uh, when the market fell in the period 2011 to 2015 and wiped out 85% of the AUM that he managed, uh, dusted himself off, uh, reached into savings, doubled down and tripled down, uh, and grew a spectacular, an already spectacular fortune in more spectacular fashion. Very few people have the psychological fortitude to take uh, a whipping like that 
and come back stronger.